Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash Insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. All in all, if you're hunting out West in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Hi, folks. This is Bruce Hutchin, the host and executive producer of Whitetail Rendezvous. Welcome you to another episode. We're heading out to Pennsylvania. We're going to meet up with Brandon Presley. And Brandon just loves, now he, he's got a love affair with hunting. Mountain Bucks, DIY, Bubba Flan. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bruce, for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you because, you know, you're one of these guys that just likes to mix it up on public land. And even though there's over 9 million hunters in uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, you seem to feel that uh, you can beat the odds and be successful. Why is that? Um, like, I, uh, just opportunity everywhere. I mean, the amount of public land that's available for anybody to go and hunt. Um, Tons of bucks out there, tons of doe. You know, I know PA's gotten a bad rap lately of uh, not really having a lot of big doe populations, but um, they're, they're pretty much just held in the little pockets. And um, really, your effort really determines your success when it comes to that. And uh, it's pretty much what I love about it. The harder I work, it seems like the more success I achieve. You mentioned uh, pockets. Now, if we're talking about, you know, mountain terrain, uh, heavy timber, not a lot of ag, I don't think. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So where would the does be hanging out in that type of terrain? Um, I like to hunt the top. I, I like the tops of the mountains. Um, number one, they're, they're really difficult to access for um, a lot of guys who are out of shape. So that, that cuts down on the amount of pressure. Um, it's pretty steep up there, rocky, nasty, deer feel safe. Um, but you're also going to have your sections of mountain down low that just get overlooked because people just think there's not going to be deer there and they walk right past them. So it's just, uh, it's like a constant scouting game, you know, you really got to put your time in, but once you find them, you can, you hunt them accordingly and don't put too much pressure on them. You can pretty much have your pickings. Oh, well, that's a pretty confident guy. If I may so, um, say so myself, you know, um, you're on public land. Okay. I get it you know, going to the top of the mountains because a lot of people won't do, put that effort in. They just flat won't. But the little honey holes that people walk by, that's more of intuition, gut feel type of thing, plus being able to read the sign. So let's talk about, let's camp there a little bit. and Let's talk about those lower areas that have deer, but everybody walks by them. Why do they walk by them? Um, I, I think there's a, a pretty common misconception. People just don't think the deer are going to hang out that close to a parking area or a road. And then uh, they just do. I mean, they, they don't get any pressure down there, though. So, you know, they might even sit within viewing distance of a parking lot and, and watch the hunters walk up the mountain in the morning or, or come back down. And uh, if they don't get bumped out of there, I mean, and, and they got everything they need, food cover, uh, a wind advantage, they're just going to sit and stay. So it's just... It's just one of those things you just ha kind of have to be on top of and uh, just be aware of. No, have you ever hunted deer in these close proximities to roads or buildings or parking lots? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had a little bit of success there. No, how do you? But do it's, that? Uh, it, well, it's it's like a what's well, a fine line too because if you let's say you get in there and you you harvest a deer, whether it's a buck or a doe, you sort of 
spoiled that spot. I mean, they're not going to keep hanging around if they, they know that they've sort of been busted, so to speak. Um, so it's like one of those ever changing things like year by year, it'll, you know, it could be hot one year and then cold the next. Then, you know, the following season, it turns hot again. But I'm I don't thinking... think there's, I don't think there's any real like distinct way to describe it. You know, it's just uh, ever evolving. Now, are you putting a stand up or, or is it spot and stalk? I'll just I'll just go in, um, scout. And if I see something I like, pick a tree or actually I usually pick two or three trees based upon the wind. And I'll just go with the climber and hang. Um if I feel real confident in that area, I might hunt it two, maybe three times. Um, but if I, if, if it's sort of, you know, I'm not really sure, I might just hunt it once. And if I don't see anything, then I'm out of there and I'm off to another spot. I don't really like to hang around one area too long. These deer are pretty smart. And they'll figure it out quick. Yeah. Now, so you pull into a parking lot, let's say, and within a quarter mile, that's where you're going to hunt. Now, what do people say when they see you going into the woods? And not climbing the mountain. <laughs> um, well, I'm usually if I'm going in the morning, I'm in there pretty early. I don't really, I don't really run into too many hunters in the morning. Um, if it's an afternoon hunt, I'm really cautious if I'm going to be hunting that close. You know, I'm going to try to make sure that nobody else is around because I don't want to really spoil it too much. But um, it's happened before. You know, I've run into other hunters, and um, I'll just tell them I was out that way. I don't really pinpoint where I've been hunting at. Yeah, I. I- I think it's kind of interesting. I can tell you in 476, 79 uh, shows, nobody's talked about, you know, hunting the parking lot, you know, within a quarter mile or, or less of, of a parking lot. And, you know, it makes sense because I can remember, you know, some places in Wisconsin where I did a lot of hunting that I'd go and I'd hunt, you know, I'd sit in my tree stand, then I'd come back and I'd have my headlamp on and all of a sudden, you know, less than 100 yards from the parking lot, you know, there goes a the doe, you know, I can't say mm-hmm. I ever saw any bucks, but less than a hundred yards, all of a sudden I bust her, you know, she snorts and, and goes, goes her way. And I'm going, gee, <laughs> I should have been hunting the parking lot. There was this, uh, there was this one, it was down below lots of pines and, uh, just a ridiculous scrape line. And this was probably 10, 11 years ago. And, um, I had a trail camera at the time, put a trail camera up on that scrape line and I hunted three quarters of a mile away, come back down out of the mountain. And, uh, I was like, you know, I'm going to check, I want to check the trail camera on that scrape line. Now that day that I was going to hunt down low, but talk myself out of it, there was, uh, an eight point there in the morning and he's probably 130 class and about a upper 130, low 40 class, 10 point there in the evening on that scrape line. And this is probably 200 yards from a parking lot. So that's sort of when it, it all, the light bulb went off in my head and said, you know, maybe you should pay a little bit more attention to these areas. But uh, it was a hard lesson learned. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, this is, to me, it's groundbreaking stuff. And there's other guys and gals out there that said, shh, don't tell the secret. You know, because I've always heard that, you know, especially during gun season, the army moves in and, and they're busting bucks and does all the way, you know, all the way to the stand somewhat. On, on on public land but here if you think about it and, and do some scouting i think that's the critical thing you know pick pick your poison you had a hot scrape line and everything was there for for deer to be there whether nocturnal or not you wouldn't have any idea until you pulled your cards but that you know that doesn't definitely make sense now let's talk about briefly um and we're going to get into trail cameras later in the show but right now so you hung a trail camera but aren't you afraid of you know jesse james walking off with your trail camera always in the back of my mind always sometimes you just got to take those risks but uh yeah i think about that theft all the time and uh it's kind of gotten to the point where uh you know i've sort of accepted if it's going to happen it's going to happen you know i mean fortunately i've i've not had any any camera stolen so that's always a plus but um guys will they'll mess with them sometimes yeah and it does not, happen Right. Yeah, not necessarily break them, but, uh, you know, they acknowledge that they see them or uh, they'll pull the card if it's not locked up to see what's on it. And, but no theft so far. So that's good. Yeah, it is. And unfortunately, um, it happens, even happens out, out west in the mountains because more and more guys and gals are uh, using uh, trail cameras on, you know, elk habitat, wallows, old wallows, old rubs, similar stuff that you do for whitetails where they're doing the same stuff for for elk and uh, you know cards disappear 
<laughs> you know, car disappear and the whole thing disappears. I had a buddy, the person cut the tree down because he had it locked or, you know, oh, wow. and the guy was chainsaw the sucker right off. Yeah, that's so really taking it to the tree. <laughs> well, it must have been a hell of a honey hole. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> and they didn't want him to, you know, hunt in their bowl and it's all on on public land that's for sure so it's it's just interesting out there and you know i'll just say this and, and shut up uh you know just don't do that you know one trail cameras yeah. cost a buck i understand that but you know somebody had to buy that and you go rip off a you know a line of trail cameras that's that's just not good stuff i mean yeah that's low ball they spend the money for it they spend the time to put it up there They've got the excitement built up. You know, I can't wait to go check it. And then they get up there and someone snagged it. And it's that's it's got to be one of the worst feelings in the world. Yeah. And so we're going to move on from that. So so we're hunting. We're hunting there. Okay. How do you pick your areas you're going to hunt? Now, you said there's thousands of, of, of acres of, uh, of public land. But how do you decide, okay, where Brandon's going to hunt? Um, well, you can look at uh, topographic maps. Uh, saddles benches uh any kind of terrain change um the game commission now is doing a lot of these controlled burns and uh even clear cuts here in the mountain which is just great i mean that's just spurring tons of deer activity um keying in on those points those transitions the edges everything like that um you know i do a lot of cyber scouting and i'll just mark it i got apps on my phone mark points of interest I get up in the mountain. I'll walk my way through the mountain on the, the different points that I have marked and try to find uh, trails, rubs, bedding. Um, scrape lines up here are huge. If you find a good scrape line, I mean, you're, it's almost guaranteed that it's gonna it's, it's gonna be back next year. Um, you're, just, you're talking you about know, scrape lines, not rub lines, right? Yeah, just scrape lines. I've never really, I don't know, I've never really found a real concrete rub line through the mountain that has led me to um, some success. I mean, I'm sure they exist, but I'd rather hunt a scrape line over a rub line. And you're talking it's what? My, three, my, three or four, five, half a dozen scrapes um, in, in a line? Three, four, five, and um, they can be short-lived. You know, that could be 100 yards, or they could stretch out to um, the longest one I've ever tracked was a quarter mile. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was just just huge it just kept going and going so, so why do you think that behavior let's talk about that behavior because a lot of places we've all heard of community scrapes and you know you'll have a 10 by 10 you know scrape um i'm just thinking in some places i've seen a couple of scrapes you know lined out but i haven't seen multiple scrapes i don't know if i've just been in the wrong place or haven't been looking in the right places but uh, what's your thought about these multiple scrapes that, you know, are, are signposts and, you know, and uh, running behavior indicators uh, to us all? Uh, multiple scrapes with lots of licking branches that are torn up and uh, in a condensed area. And I'm, I'm hunting it. I'm going to be on that late October, early November. That to me is, is, is prime. I mean, that's what I, I key in on that time of year. Um, but the key for me, honestly, when I'm looking at those, is is not as much the, the pawing on the, the forest floor, but licking branches. I mean, if there's more licking branches, the better. And if they're twisted and, and tangled and snapped, I mean, that's something that really gets me excited. And uh, that means there's a lot of deer hitting them. A lot of deer increases your chances of, of you know, buck. More The more deer that are on that, the more buck that are going to hit it. And, and that's. You know, that I'm just thinking here, you know, with the orbital gland and, and all the things they do when they, you know, on, on the licking branch and all that uh, fuss, you must have a lot of deer, you know, a, a lot of uh, mature bucks that could be a year and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half years old. But, um, you know, to have that type of activity, that's that's what I'm thinking. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of a lot more younger buck that use those than older buck. But, uh, you know, there's there's. I wouldn't, I, I would say an older buck here on game lands is, is four. Um, you've got your, a decent amount of three year olds, but they're all going to be hitting those scrapes. Um, I got a lot of trail camera footage that have, you know, got me going on that. And, uh, you kind of learn what to look for through trial and error. And, um, that's pretty much what keys me off more than anything is the, the licking branch or branches, I should say. Yeah. Now, have you ever just run out the, um, uh, you know, you figure out which way the buck's going? Or then be going both ways, but figure out which way he's going. Have you ever backtracked to see where he was eating or sleeping or hanging? Oh yeah, um, 
I, I try to look for beds too, and I've I've found more than my fair share of mountain buck beds. Um, but it just seems like there's just so much opportunity for them to bounce around from three to four different beds. Um, it's really hard, or it's been really hard for me at least to be able to pinpoint one one bed to hunt a certain bed for a certain buck. Um, I just I just don't see why they would spend you know all their time coming back to a certain bed. So I just think they rotate those their bedding areas. Um, even with food, you know, with the abundance of acorns, um, I don't really think that they could key in on one bench or one ridge. Uh, it just seems like we just had pretty good acorn crop the past few years that everything's just so widespread. And that's it's sort of why I like keying in on these scrapes. They just seemed a little bit more concentrated and you can kind of, I want to say predict their movement a little bit better, but it just seems like the window to hunt those is a little more concentrated than if you would try to hunt that particular bed or the, you know, the Oak Ridge. Okay. Tell me how you, you're setting up on this scrape line. Uh, you got a climber. I'm thinking climber versus hang on. So you get a climber and, uh, you know, which, which scrape do you pick to, you know, sit left, right, east, west, north, south, depending on the wind. You know, tell us about your setup. Well, the top of the mountain, the wind's going to be a lot more consistent than if you're off the edge. Um, and if you're middle or low, it, it, it's tough. It's really going to scroll on you. So I like to find something up top consistent with the and anything along that scrape line, if it's a drawn out scrape and it'll sort of pinch any kind of deer movement, um, you know, you're just hunting a pinch point then along a scrape line. And, and if, uh, if it's a cluster of scrapes, like you were saying, little community scrape area, just try to set up with the wind and, and best cover I can to my advantage. And, um, uh, just sit and wait, you know, see what comes along. Maybe <laughs> rattle a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> now, do you grunt? It really is a waiting game. So you, um, if I have to, yeah. I've run it in bucks before, yeah. Because rattling, I'm a little bit weary. Go ahead. A little bit weary up here, though. Um, you know, they just high pressure land. Everybody's got a grunt call. You really got to you gotta be careful with it. Sometimes it'll just take off on you. How about the same thing for rattling? Because at the right time, if you hit it right, rattling is a blast. I mean, You'll see a lot of deer. Yeah, I like to be a little bit more um, subtle with my rattling. I don't like to get too aggressive with it. I think I think if you're a little bit more subtle with it, um, you're more prone to get a reaction out of some some buck that's close by, as opposed to being too aggressive. They're kind of like ears up, tail goes up, and then they they're a little bit more cautious approaching, or they might just hightail it out of there. So now, I'm, I'm you, pretty I'm pretty subtle with that calling. I do. So if you're subtle, then Deer's got great ears, and, you know, if the wind's right, you know, it's going to carry. But, you know, is a lot different. You know, what well, is? I, I, I mean, when you snort wheeze um, those suckers, I mean, I, they're I, loud. I snort, I snort wheezed the buck before, and uh, he took off like I slapped him in his hindquarters. Because <laughs> he probably got he his ass gone. kicked. He probably got his yeah. butt kicked. He had nothing to do with it. He was out of there. So that was the last <laughs> time I did that. <laughs> I was, I was at the farm and I got one little stand. I, I just love the hunt. It's just, it's just, it's so pretty, whatever. And so I'm rattling and this, I see this eight pointer come through and I'm rattling again. And then he kind of stops and then I snort ways. He just, just like you said, he was gone. <laughs> I'm gonna get to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked yeah, to my buddy and said, he got his butt kicked by something. Cause I'm loud. I'm, you know, I am, I am loud. I can be, I can, you know, or, or, you know, I, I can put it really down. They're going to be 10 yards from me to even hear me. But, <laughs> but for the most part, for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty loud and banging. One of my buddies said, you sound like a Muhammad Ali, you know, <laughs> fighting, just cracking it. But, you know, that's one nice thing. And listeners, just, you know, we're, we're kind of meandering around here tonight, but that's one nice thing. It's your hunt. It's your technique. And if you get something working, I don't care what the guys at the bar, at the shop, at school, at, at work, I don't care what they say. If it's working for you, keep doing it. Your yeah. thoughts on that, no. Brandon? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, and don't be afraid to try some. There's a, I've there's a lot of trial and error involved with everything, um, with bow hunting. And if you find something that works, you know, try it again if it keeps working just keep doing it yeah uh, and it's so many times listeners we're afraid to scare that buck away you know and don't do that to yourself just enjoy the experience and learn 
just like Brandon sharing some, you know, some great tips. Uh, you know, he's learned a lot by trial and error, and that's the only way to do it. And just go out and fail a lot, and all of a sudden you're going to get better and better. I know, I know that, you know, a hundred percent. Can't can't go into the woods uh, or the mountain and and be scared of uh, of trying something. You know, you might you might lose your opportunity that way. You know, nothing nothing wrong with trying it once. And uh, you never know what might happen. Now, talk to me. It's 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. It's dark. Do you put your headlamp on to go up the mountain? Yeah. Yep. And it uh, depends where I'm at. If I'm going to use, like, a, a subdued red light or if I need to, like, high beam it to make my way through the terrain. But um, the closer I get to my stand, the, the more cautious I am. Obviously, you don't want to be crashing through the mountain and uh you know when i get to my stand it's 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 uh it's red light only you know you don't want to have your high beam 500 lumen headlamp shining around when you're about to set up <laughs> just now, in case you have to set up every every time or in pennsylvania you can leave your stand out um you can you have to you have to i think put your cid number on which is on your tag and uh, a name and i believe a phone number if you're going to leave it up there, but I'm, I'm in and out every day, take my stand with me and, um, haul it in, haul it out. That's how I hunt. Even if, even if I'm going back to the same area, I'll haul it out. It's just how I am. Just my preferred method. Now are you using hang ons or, or climbers? I, uh, I have one of each. I prefer my hand climber, my lone wolf. Um, I'm just more comfortable with that than anything, but I have climbing sticks and hang on if needed. But, uh, a lot of these trees, I can I can get up with my climber, but uh, there's some situations where the tree's just too small and you have to use a hang on, and that's pretty much why I have it as a backup scenario. So let's break down an area. So you think you'd like to hunt an area? Do you do um, Google Earth or other uh, apps before you go in, or do you go in and do a speed scout and either confirm or or eliminate? Um, I'll look at it on. Uh, I have like a an app called my topo um or topo pro something like that i'll go in mark points of interest where i believe i might find something and then uh might go in and either confirm if i was right or wrong and you know i'm constantly marking um scrapes um bedding heavy trails um i will even mark other tree stands that i see or if, uh, if i come across other people's trail cameras mark those on my uh, my app as well and when I look at the big overview, I can kind of get a, a feel for what's going on. Okay, this tree stand and, and trail camera that I saw is close to this parking area. That's where that guy's coming from. Sort of formulate a plan on how I want to access the hunt and, uh, you know, go from there. So you go in, you, you scout it, you see some sign, and then how, how do you figure out how to get right back to that place? you just pin it with GPS? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll do like... Uh, a go-to. I want to go to this waypoint. It'll give me straight line distance or whatever. I don't always go straight line, but, um, you know, I find out how I want to access it, which, uh, which way I want to go based on the wind direction, where I feel the deer might be and the best way for me to get to that stand. And, um, like I said, I might hunt that stand once and that's it. Or, uh, you know, I might come back two, maybe three times, but I don't really like to hunt the same tree or the same area more than three times maybe four times at most i like to stay pretty mobile so why is that you know three sits four sits i'm out of here a couple of reasons uh number one the deer are pretty good at figuring out the pressure up here i mean that's their whole existence they've been pressured from day one um through archery season a ton during rifle a little bit late season it keeps smelling you or they come across your ground scent and it's going to be um it ain't going to be too long. I mean, they're just going to be out of there. Number two, um, like I said, you got tens of thousands of acres of mountain land up here. And uh, why should I limit myself to this one little spot? You know, got to spread myself out and see what's available. So I hear you saying that. So in August, how many places do you have set up that you want to hunt? Oh, by August? Yeah. Um, I would say, oh, gosh. Uh, I would say I'd usually have like five or six areas. and. In each of those areas, I will have three to four, three to four, quote unquote, stand locations that I want to hunt. Yeah. And then there's the, uh, you know, there's the always ever changing in season scouting, which could throw another loop into it, you know, could create another opportunity for me. So 
so basically what I hear you saying, you've got 15 to 20 uh, setup sites. Whether or not you're going to use it or not, who knows, depending on the wind. I mean, there's a lot of variables that are going to, you know, going to hammer that. But then how do you decide, you know, your rotation, I guess, for lack of a better word? Because you've got plenty of places to go. Now we've got to put them on a rotation so we don't burn them. And I like, you know, one or two, three, four sits at most, and I'm out of there. Um, you know, uh, I usually have a good handle on which box are using which area. And it, it's just just kind of rotate you know sometimes i just get up in the morning i think i'm gonna hunt spot a and you know that's where i'll hunt and maybe the next day i'll hunt spot b um pretty much wherever i want to go is where i want to go um the wind for the most part in the fall is pretty consistent so it's it's not too much of a game changer although sometimes you get an odd wind here or there and um you know that might play a factor into how i hunt certain areas but um pretty much just go with wherever i feel like I'm going to have the best opportunity that day. So the forecast says on Thursday or Friday um, that a front's coming through. So now what do you do? It's it's Tuesday night. You hear the weather report, a front's coming through on Thursday. One, can you get off of work if, if in fact, you do work? And then, yeah. two, how the heck do you decide from all your you know potential sets where you want to be? Because, as um, you know, fronts are great. I'm assuming you're... We're talking cold front. Right, cold front. And what time of year is it? Late October. Early October. Yeah, it's before the rut. Yeah, it's before the rut. Hunt whatever, uh, whatever scrape I feel like is going to produce, that's what I'm going to be on if there's a cold front late October. Based upon my my uh, my early fall scouting, you know, with trail cameras, find it, you know, which bucks are in which area, and uh, that's how I'll approach that. Now, what are you doing all day sit? Uh, late October? Yeah. Yeah, if I... If I can, yeah, yep, yeah, because in the cold front, the barometric pressure, you're gonna have a big delta in that, and the bucks we know are gonna be moving, and they're not chasing yet. They might be seeking, or they might be just opening up scrapes and you know, and setting yeah. the stage. More often than not, you're pretty much just gonna get your you know late morning, early evening activity, but late October, I mean, you just don't know. Something could show up midday, so I would definitely sit all day. Tell me a little bit about the buck over your head. It, that came out of Pennsylvania, I'm assuming. Yep, that was uh, 2009, I believe. Yeah. Uh, November 11th, which I've shot four buck on November 11th. That seems to be my lucky day. <laughs> yeah, stick <laughs> with it, right? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah uh, honestly, I was hunting a scrape, and uh, it was real cold that day. I don't know what the temperature was, but it was it was real cold. It was pretty early, 8:30 in the morning, I think. And I heard this crashing. I was like, what the heck is that? <clears throat> and this buck just came crashing through this blowdown. He didn't walk around it. I mean, he went right through the middle of it. Came down, <clears throat> hit the trail. And he turned and he just came on a line right to that scrape. Got to the scrape and I just smoked him 15 yards. He ran and crashed. He didn't, he was completely clueless that you were, you know, there was a human being within 100 miles of him. Oh, yeah. No idea. Yep. He, he didn't know what was happening. Well, see, persistence being the right place right time um you're gonna have to make sure you get off on on november 11th oh yeah always because <laughs> <laughs> that's important let's switch it up and let's talk about your trail uh camera use on uh on uh, public land and uh, the pluses and the minuses um well i like to run mine on video mode i don't like pictures pictures will sort of give me an idea of what's happening but video with audio is is the whole shebang really um huge learning tool um and um mostly uh, like i said i'm i'm a big proponent of uh scrapes with hunting and uh trail camera use um i like to put them in easy access funnels something that i can i can get in put the camera up and get out without creating too much of a disturbance and uh, <clears throat> trails edge trails you know any kind of transition point seems to be another another good one for me but always video mode that's that's the big thing right there now i haven't heard that i'm just thinking back last few shows uh so video mode that doesn't that suck up a lot of your um storage oh, yeah. yeah i run 32 gigabyte cards um energizer lithium batteries you know it's it's a little bit more expensive but i feel like uh, the information that I get from that is is well worth it. Now, how many minutes of video can you get off a card? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, you've got 
I've got some brownings that are like, you know, full HD and, and they go fill up pretty quick. And then uh, I got some lower end HD quality brownings that, you know, I can get a, quite a few more videos on there. But it all depends on the compression size of the video and the video length and all that jazz. It's really dependent upon each camera. And does it depend on the dough or the, or, or the buck that's dancing around the, the scrape or doing whatever? I mean, to, uh, on yeah, and off. I mean, to, um, I like to run either 10 or 20 second videos and I'll do like either a five second, 10 second delay, um, depending upon the setup and, and the area too. I mean, um, typically trails, I'd like to have a shorter setting, uh, for the delay because it's, they're not going to hang around too long. Uh, scrape, I might just have it on a shorter video and a longer delay because they might be there a little bit while. So just depending upon how I use them. So you got this video, did you download it all to your laptop or your smartphone or you know, how are you viewing it? It's more important, how are you building up uh, your storehouse or your journal? Um, I check them on my phone, which really just eats the battery up. So I got I to gotta go a different route with that next year. I think maybe I'll take a tablet with me or something. Um, bring the cards home, sort through the videos, keep the ones that I want, delete the ones that I don't. It's a whole process. But, uh, yeah, I've got my, I got my file, my folders of, of the different bucks. Um, and I've got the, the in season footage. I've got the post season footage. I even have a separate, uh, folder that I have named daylight shooters, which is, uh, you know, daylight shooter box during the season, you know, just to see if I can, uh, kind of decipher any kind of a trend in their daylight movement. Yeah. And a lot of guys, you know, they spend hours, you know, when they get a lot of cameras and they're using photos, but I mean, they'll from year to year, they'll watch, you know, buck number 572 grow and become, you know, a, you know, a hit list type buck, and, and they become really familiar with them. And it's part of scouting, you know, not only are you watching the buck, but you're, you're scouting and watching his behavior and seeing, you know, what he's doing or not doing. And then the other thing is moon phases and barometric pressure and wind direction. How do you measure those with your videos? Um, well, barometric pressure, I don't really pay too much mind to, um, Wind direction, I typically just use that to, to set up. I don't really, I won't hunt a particular spot based off of a certain wind thinking a certain buck will show up. I just, I haven't found that correlation to be true up in the mountain. Um, moon phase, mm, I don't know. I'm still on the fence on that one. I think maybe it, it plays a part, but, um, honestly, the biggest, the biggest thing that I found to kind of spur any kind of movement, um, is, is cold fronts, really. I mean, you got a front coming in and it just, it just is like, boom, just sets them off. So that's, that's the biggest factor that I look for. Yeah, and there's tons written about, you know, tons written about uh, moon phases. And some people do play the barometric pressure. And obviously the wind, you know, affects, you know, if your stand isn't in the right place, then you can't hunt your stand. Uh, and and cold fronts, I think everybody, you know, if they have to go to work on a cold front, that they're chomping at the bit to, you know, get in their stand at least, you know, for 20 minutes. 30 minutes, it doesn't matter just to be out there because you just don't know. That could be any time in the fall. It doesn't have to be, you know, after, you know, October 26th. Yeah, I, had a, I had a cold front come through mid-October this year during the, you know, October lull or whatever. And uh, it just, it set them off. It was, it was hot there for a couple of days. Well, yeah. The action, the action, uh, temps were cold, but the action was hot. <laughs> <laughs> So, Brandon, you know, we've talked a lot about hunting. Obviously, you, you've got some, you know, you know what you're doing. And as I understand it, you started archery hunting when you're 20 years old, and you're basically soft, uh, self-taught. Uh, what's that story? Um, I just, I wanted more. Um, and at the time, archery was my only way to do that. So I went out and bought a bow, fixed sporting goods, and got it all set up there and uh, tried to get my hands on as many books as I could about archery and uh, how to be a better archer. Started buying uh, DVDs, you know, pretty much all the Drury Brothers DVDs back then and, and watched them and uh, practice, practice, practice. First year I saw deer, didn't kill any. And uh, I believe it was my, my third hunt of my second year of bow hunting. I uh, I blew a fawn in distress call. I had one come in and, and I whacked her and that was it, man. I was hooked. It tastes good too, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, it's, it's remarkable. Now, I, I'm assuming you're a solo hunter, but do you have a crew you kind of hang with and, and switch off, you know, techniques and, 
and talk about hunting with? Uh, not really. I may have a buddy that hunts some private ground close to where I'm at, but uh, it's a, that's a whole different ball game. I mean, he's got deer out the wazoo, and uh, you know, I'm a couple miles away, and his deer are pretty hard to come by. So it's it's like night and day difference. But yeah, pretty much just go out it by myself. Well, you seemingly, and you know, you got one buck on the wall right behind you. You know, uh, have done pretty well. You know, figuring it out, and you know, I love how you know you broke down hunting, you know, hunting the ridge tops and hunting the mountain tops and, uh, you know, not even worrying about the between stuff, but just going, getting right up on the top of the mountain, looking for saddles, looking for transition pinch points, whatever. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I'm taking away and listeners, you should, you know, um, scrape lines, not just scrape here and then, you know, a scrape, you know, quarter mile away, but, uh, you know, actually, we can see bucks. Multiple bucks are, are working the the territory, and I I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think the key to that is, uh, you know, you're gonna have your doe groups that, you know, like I said, we're in pockets. But if you if you find those scrapes near those doe groups, I mean, the the bucks they know about them, and it's just it's a, uh it's a, just a numbers game. I mean, eventually they're gonna show up. It hasn't failed me yet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well. Last, I want to wrap up the show with, you know, explain to people, you, you touched on it, but how hard it is to get up to the, the mountain tops, um, again, not, you know, on side hills or anything, and why that sets you apart from other people in Pennsylvania, especially archers. Uh, what was that again? About uh, hunting the mountain tops and why that sets you apart from other archers in, in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm... Um... I think it's just an effort thing. You know, you gotta, you gotta work for whatever you get. And, uh, I think that applies to just life in general. And, um, you know, going to the top is, is difficult. It's not easy. You're going to sweat and, uh, it's going to be quite a workout for your legs. And if you're carrying a stand and clothes and a bow, you know, it's going to be a workout for your back. And, um, it's, uh, it's a physical challenge. It's a mental challenge. And then once you're up there to stay all day, I mean, it just, it adds to it. And I think a lot of guys just really aren't that committed. And um, I think if they would show that commitment, it'd probably, it'd probably pay off for them. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, we're going to wrap the show. So on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America, Brandon Presley, thank you so much for being a guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. Thanks, Bruce, for having me. I appreciate it. We're going to head north of the border and connect with Jason Dick. Now, Jason is the guy that if you want to go someplace, give him a call because he's been to Kyrgyzstan, he's been to New Zealand, he's been to Africa, all over North America, and he's quite successful. Why is he successful? Because he's a hard hunter. Jason's going to bring some tips and techniques that if you're heading north of the border, you're heading to the Canadian Rockies or any place with Jason, he's going to help you get ready, get set, and bring that positive attitude. Because when I asked Jason, what's the number one thing people need to bring when they're coming hunting with you, he says a positive attitude. So you're going to have some chuckles and we're going to have some fun with Jason Dick from Canada. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.